Good morning. It is Sunday, May 24th. Welcome to uh, Worship at the Houston Church of Christ. And uh, just a couple of quick announcements. We are trying to do a singing Tuesday night at 6 p.m. here at the building, at the property. We're going to be in the front yard on the grass. Uh, so again, that's 6 p.m. If you want to do this, we're going to mark out spots on the lawn for every family that comes so that everybody can stay uh, socially, you know, responsible, social distancing. We're going to do our best to do that. I'm going to ask you that if you're interacting with people, you wear a mask, stay six feet apart, uh, do all those things that we are being asked to do. And so let's get to come together uh, Monday night at 6 p.m. If you're going to come, we need you to RSVP because we're going to make a special uh, box for every single family that comes or special painting on the lawn for every family that comes. So let us know if you're going to come. Um, again, 6 p.m. Monday night. We, I'm sorry, Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Don't get that wrong. I need to know by Monday, though, if you're coming. So you need to let me know uh, if you're coming by Monday. So bring a chair or, uh, or a blanket to sit on the grass. We're not going to be providing chairs for everybody, so make sure you bring your own. Um, the bathroom and the building is not going to be open, so you know don't come and think you're going to go into the building and, and get things. We're going to keep that locked off. Uh, just again, trying to be respectful of what we have been asked to do. So again, we're going to come Tuesday night, do some singing, and have a short devotional. Um, so please uh, be ready for that. If you want to come, let us know by Monday. Uh, also, if you need Lord's Supper, there are some at the building, individual cups. Uh, if you need some, let us know. If you need it brought to you, let us know. We can do that as well. Uh, surely make sure that happens. If you have other needs, let us know. If you need medications or groceries, again, same thing, same announcements we've been making. Let us know. Uh, prayer requests. Uh, Brother Flippins is redoing, doing well. He's responding well to his cancer treatment. Uh, he did have some blood pressure issues this week. His daughter said, so keep him in your prayers, but things are looking uh, at least positive at this point for him, uh, so please keep him in your prayers. Um, regarding Emily Sliger and her passing away, uh, the family simply said that once all of this coronavirus stuff clears up, they'll uh, see about doing something to honor her at that time, but uh, nothing is planned right now. Again, prayers for wisdom for our, our, our president, wisdom for our scientists and those who are in places of authority who are making decisions, prayers for wisdom for them. Prayers for the church here in Houston, uh, as we will at some point, possibly in the next you know month or so, begin to look at how can we come back together and what is that going to look like. So prayers for wisdom on the timing of that and how to set that up in the most responsible way. So again, keep that in your prayers for the world leaders, our, our, our country, but also for the church locally. Um, let's go ahead and begin with the word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and we pray that you will bless our worship service, that you will bless our time together. We pray, Father, for Brother Flippins. We thank you that he is responding well to the treatment. We pray, Father, for his continual uh, improvement. We pray, Father, for the blood pressure issues that he was having, that they may not be a reoccurring problem. We pray for the families of those that have lost loved ones, for the Sliger family, for my Aunt Mary's family, for the baby Oliver who passed away, for his family. We pray for them and ask your comfort for them all. We pray, Father, for the leaders in this world and in our country. We pray for President Trump and we pray for him to have wisdom. And we pray for those uh, who are advising him to have wisdom. And we pray, Father, for the church here in Houston that we will have wisdom as we look, Father, uh, to coming back together and and to try to figure out when that would be appropriate and what that should look like. And Father, help us to do things in a way that are pleasing to you. And that Father, are not disrespectful uh, to, to the government that is in place. We ask you to give us wisdom. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and start off with a song. I'll be on the screen here. And again, please sing along. whispers peace within, peace, perfect peace, by thronging duties pressed, do the will of Jesus this day. 
his rest Neath perfect peace With loved ones far away In Jesus keeping we are safe and may his perfect peace our future all unknown Jesus we know and he is on the So at this point, we're going to uh, open our Bibles and prepare for the Lord's Supper. So if you have your Bible, you are certainly welcome to follow along. Uh, I'm going to be reading in Psalm 22. And this is a psalm that is applied numerous times in the New Testament by New Testament writers, by the Holy Spirit. This chapter is applied numerous times, quoted, uh, direct quotations and, and several allusions as well, uh, concerning Jesus Christ and his time of suffering. So I want to go ahead and read several of the verses of Psalm 22 as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Let's read those first two verses uh, right now. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, yet I have no rest. And of course, we will recognize this immediately as being quoted by Jesus on the cross. Uh, and you can see that reference there in Matthew 27 and Mark 15. Let's skip down and let's read beginning in verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. And again, you'll recognize this as those people who passed by the cross. They did these things. Go ahead and read, read verse 8 through 11. He relies on the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let the Lord deliver him since he takes pleasure in him. You took me from the womb, making me secure while at my mother's breast. I was given over to you at birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Look at this request. Do not be far from me because distress is near and there is no one to help. Let's skip down to verse 14. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And again, you can see the reference there in John 20. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and they cast a lot from my clothing. And again, that verse is also quoted in the New Testament and applied to Jesus Christ. All of these verses, all this, this chapter is clearly pointing to Jesus Christ and the suffering that he was going through, the things he was enduring. And again, just how, how brutal the uh, the crucifixion was not just the act itself but all the things that surrounded it the mistreatment by people the piercing of his hands the dogs that surround him the wagging of the heads the mocking uh, the mocking that they cast upon Jesus Christ and that's again reflected here in verse 8 he relies on the lord let the lord rescue him and we saw that uh, on the cross there as well didn't we uh, as Jesus was there and they were crying and they were mocking him and they spat, they spit on Jesus Christ. So again, all of these things that we see in Psalm 22 are these things here in this chapter. Numerous 
uh, times they're referenced in the New Testament and applied to that time of Jesus Christ on the cross. I want to go ahead and we're going to play another song uh, at this point. And uh, this is a new song, um, but the words are beautiful and I think it's appropriate for uh, taking of the Lord's Supper. So please sing along with this music. You were rejected, Lord, those who passed by, even averted their gaze from your side. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spoke not a word. Chose to be silent, though you did no wrong. Nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come. Yet by your suffering our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high. Jesus, the name above all names. God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high. Jesus, the name above all names. You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by. Even averted their gaze from your side. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spoke not a word. But chose to be silent, though you did no wrong. Nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come. Yet by your suffering our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high. Jesus, the name above all names. God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high. Jesus, the name above all names. You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by. Even averted their gaze from your side. Such was the suffering you bore for us. So look at the lyrics on that song for a second. Uh, they're clearly, it's a clearly a song about the suffering and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And it references several times about God enthroning Jesus Christ, uh, putting him on his throne. The other song that we sang a moment ago, Peace, Perfect Peace, uses a similar phrase talking about God on the throne. You know, last week we were studying in Psalm chapter 9, and in fact, if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to the book of Psalms. Uh, so we were studying last week in Psalm chapter 9, and in Psalm chapter 9, what we see is that David is calling for God who is on his throne to act as judge of the world, to, to give righteous judgment. The wicked are thriving. The wicked are doing these things. The, the, the righteous are afflicted. And so there was this appeal in chapter 9 for God on his throne to do something as a righteous judge. God is on his throne. God is still on his throne, isn't he? And, and so this morning, as we go through our lesson, uh, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 10. Uh, and again, Psalm 9 and 10 really form uh, two parts uh, of the same idea. Uh, a lot of times, even in the ancient manuscripts, and even in the ancient translations, like the Septuagint, chapters 9 and 10 were put together as one unit. 
Uh, they, they together form an acrostic poem, a poem uh, where every section begins with an, a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So chapters 9 and 10 really are psalms taken together. And really at the heart of both of these psalms, there is a problem that the wicked are, are afflicting the righteous. The wicked are afflicting those who are oppressed and those who are weak. And again, uh, you need to kind of look at these two psalms together. And even some of the preceding psalms also have some ideas that fit in with this too. Uh, but last week we saw David request, David's request to God. God, act as a king, act as a judge, as a righteous king, as a righteous judge on behalf of the afflicted, on behalf of the righteous afflicted. We, asked, we, we also saw how David looked at the past actions of God. He looked at God's life, and we'll just real quickly look at this. Look at verse chapter 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. David, he recounts the deeds of God in his life, and it helps to strengthen him, doesn't it? I will recount your deeds. And today, as we are going to go through this and come into chapter 10, we're going to again see that David asked the Lord to intervene as a just king. You know, sometimes in this world, when we're looking at things, when we're looking at troubles, when we're looking at struggles, you know, we can look at things and we can sometimes question, where is God? It's not that we doubt that God exists. It's not that we doubt that he's not on his throne. We believe that. But because we don't sometimes see him acting, we don't see his actions, we don't see the bad things in the world, uh, the bad people in the world being held accountable. So where is God as this righteous judge? We don't see, we see the uh, righteous, uh, the righteous weak, the righteous needy. We see these people being afflicted and tormented. And we say, God, where are you? And so this is kind of what happens here in Psalm chapter 10, verse 1. As this psalm begins with this question, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? So there's a question for God there's an apparent problem. God doesn't seem to be there. Where are you, God? And again, I, I know that I'm already, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of ourselves, kind of, but God is there, isn't he? God is still on the throne. Even though sometimes he, we don't feel him, we, we, he seems far away when there's these times of trouble. Sometimes we sit there, we wonder, God, where are you? And it's not that David doubts God's there. David doesn't doubt that God's there, but he is perplexed by this apparent lack of action. There's this lack of justice. God seems unconcerned. But again, I'll make the point, the comment we've made a lot of times, things aren't always as they seem, are they? And again, as this fits in with chapter 9, the question may be, where is this righteous king? Where is this righteous judge? Where is the condemnation of the wicked? Where is the protection of the righteous? And as David goes through this chapter, and I believe it's David because of the same, it fits I believe in with chapter 9, so I do believe it's David here, although you don't see a title given to him specifically in chapter 10. But if you go through this, you'll notice the victims in this chapter. You'll see words like the poor You'll see this word poor uh, occurs four times. This root word occurs, occurs four times in this chapter, translated in the ESV either as poor or afflicted. Uh, these are those who don't have physically, they don't have anything. They, they are in need. They are lacking. They're the afflicted. We also see another phrase. Uh, we see, again, you can see this here in verse 8. Uh, we can see uh, innocent. Uh, this word occurs only here. But he mentions the innocent. We see another word, the helpless. This occurs three times. It occurs here in verse 8, then again in verse 14. Uh, so we see this word helpless. Uh, we see the word here in verse 14, the, the fatherless. The fatherless, those who were orphans, those who didn't have anybody to help them, those who didn't have anybody to watch over them. And so these are the people, these the helpless, the poor, the afflicted, the fatherless, the innocent. Then verse 18, you have another one, the oppressed. These are the ones who these wicked are, are mistreating in this chapter. These are the victims uh, of the wicked in this chapter. And then again, so the perpetrators, the most frequent word used to describe them is the word wicked. Uh, that word occurs uh, six times, five or six times, I, I think it's six, in this chapter. And then you'll also see them described in verse 3 as 
So here's the word wicked, um, and you'll see that word pop up several times. You have another description of them. They're the ones greedy for gain. Uh, you'll also see the phrase evildoer. That occurs one time in this chapter. At the very end of the chapter, in verse 18, they're called a man of the earth. But the most common phrase used to describe those who are mistreating the helpless, the fatherless, the poor, the most common phrase used in this chapter is just they're, they're wicked. The wicked in this chapter. So where are you, God? Where are you as the wicked thrive? So we have the question in verse 1, and then we have kind of this description of the wicked. We, have their, we, we see the claims they make. We see a description of them in verses 2 through 11. And so, uh, real quickly, notice some of their claims. We'll read verses uh, 2 through 5 here. In arrogance. In arrogance. So again, something that is, describes the wicked. In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Then here's a request. David makes three requests in this chapter. Here's a request. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. David requests, God, let them be caught up in their own in their own wicked things that they're planning, in their own wicked schemes, in their own wicked traps. God, help them be caught. And there is this idea here of a trap, uh, of being caught in a snare. So God, let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. Verse 3, for the wicked boasts, we see arrogance, we see boasting. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul. And the the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In, in the pride of his face, again, so we have arrogance, boast, pride. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts. So now we're giving a, a little bit about what his thought process is. All his thoughts are, there is no God. The wicked say there is no God. Now, um, you know, we, we live in a world where there's a lot of atheists, right? Uh, atheists who simply deny the existence of God, that there is no God. And, you know, when you deny the existence of God, if there is no God, then you can do anything you want. You don't need to live for somebody else. You can live for yourself if there is no God. I don't really think that he's talking about here about really uh, what we would call atheists today. I don't think that's what he's talking about. But what we might call this as practical atheists. People that maybe they believe in God, but they don't really care about what God wants in their life. They don't care because they don't consider what God wants when they make their own plans. When they have their own plans, they don't consider God's life in their plans. They don't consider God's wishes in their plans. And so these people, who I believe here, are they're practical atheists. This person does not live his life with any concern for God. You know, let me ask you this question. Do we ever live as practical atheists? You know, when we, when we choose to elevate our will over God's, we are living just like this. We're living as practical atheists. When we say, I know that God has asked me to do this, I know God has asked me to live in a certain way, you know, right now, you know, um, right now the government has asked us to... Uh, be careful with how we gather, and they've you know placed some restrictions, and a lot of people are upset about this. And I don't, I don't know that we need to be as upset about this as we're act, as we are sometimes responding to this. Um, you know, we are called in scriptures to obey our government, but sometimes we lay our side, our will alongside of God, and we say, you know what? I know the government's asking me to do this. They're not telling me we can't worship. They're just asking me right now to worship in a different way, carefully, cautiously, you know, through a Zoom or whatever. They're asking me to worship in a different way. But how many people have flaunted this and said, we're going to do it anyways. We're going to worship. And they do it under this mask of, well, I'm doing it to honor God. And maybe some are. I'm not trying to be unkind to all who've done this. But certainly, we have to consider what God's will is. And we have to live for God first in our life. And sometimes... Sometimes living for God means I don't do what I want. And so we can be a practical atheist. We can be a practical atheist when we prioritize our will over God's will. And we sometimes live without any concern for God in our view of our life, 
our decisions. Uh, and these wicked, they're living without any thought of God. And so they're practical atheists. In his pride, all of his thoughts are, there is no God. And again, if there's no God, we can do whatever we want. Whether that's an actual belief that there's no God or a practical belief that there's no God. That's how I really live my life. I'll do whatever I want then. Verse 5 says, His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high. Out of his sight, all of his foes, he puffs at them. Notice again this verse. All that the wicked does is seeming to prosper, doesn't it? He doesn't seem to have any ramifications from God. There doesn't seem to be any judgment that is coming against him. There doesn't seem to be any problems. So we have this phrase three times, he says in his heart. Three times this phrase is used here. So look at these three phrases. It happens first in verse 6, then verse 11, then verse 13. So let's read verses uh, 6 through 10 here. But notice this phrase. He says in his heart, this wicked person, who lives as if there is no God, this wicked person who is mistreating and hotly pursuing the, those who are weak, he says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet any adversity. Any adversity. No problem is going to come my way. He, he's arrogant. He believes he's not going to have any problems. No problems are going to move him. God is not going to pass judgment on him. He believes in his own security. Notice his mouth. So this is what his heart says. Then we have this description of his mouth in verse 7. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. So we have this idea of his mouth, his tongue. Verse 8, we have his actions described. He sits in ambush. We noticed earlier what David said, let them be caught in the schemes they have devised. So again, kind of this idea of a trap. Or, or something. Here we have this idea. He sits in ambush in the villages. This is how bad this wicked person is who's hotly pursuing the weak. The weak. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in a thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws them into his Net. Man, look at that description. That's crazy, isn't it? How what a horrible description of this wicked, these wicked people. And then it says in verse 10, the helpless are crushed, sink down and fall by his might. He says in his heart, look at this next verse. Look at this next verse. He says in his heart, so we have that phrase, he says in his heart in verse 6, he says in his heart, God has forgotten. God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. We saw that idea um, last time when we studied uh, Psalm 9, the idea of God seeing. We talked about that quite a bit. That Psalm 9 is really, it is demonstrating that we have a God who sees. We talked about Genesis, and we talked about Hagar, and the name that she gave God. You are a God who sees, and perhaps that translation might even be, you are a God who sees me. Here they say, the wicked says in his heart, God has forgotten. God doesn't remember. God, it, Man, what a disrespectful mindset, what a disrespectful thought. That someone would say this, that God, that they would say, God has forgotten. God has hidden his face. He will never see it. God's forgotten, man. God's forgotten the poor. God's forgotten the helpless. Uh, therefore, we can do whatever we want. We can act with complete impunity, right? God doesn't see anything. God doesn't see these things. And again, the wicked deny, and they say he will never see it. Verse uh Verse 12 here, um, we have now a, a second request. So the first request was back here in verse 2. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. Then we have another request here in verse uh, 12. Arise, O Lord, O God. Lift up your hands. Forget not the afflicted. 
Arise, O Lord. So again, the idea is, God, you know, here you are. Maybe you're maybe the idea is you're you're on your throne. God, get up. Do something, Lord. God, lift up your hands. Lift up your hands and help us. So they were saying in verse 11, God has forgotten. But David responds in verse 13, and he says, Don't forget. They say God has forgotten. David says, God, don't forget the afflicted. So the first request, God, let them be caught in their own schemes. The second request, God, arise, lift up your hands. Don't forget the afflicted. So again, where, where, where are the three, what are the three phrases? Uh, verse 6 are the three things he says in his heart. I shall not be moved. Verse 6. Verse 11, he says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. And then David makes the request, God, get up. God, lift up your hands. Don't forget the afflicted. Verse 13. Why does, and here's this question followed by uh, the, the wicked's thoughts. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? So there's the third phrase, and say in his heart, you will not call to account. God, the idea here in verse 13 is that God's not going to do anything. God, God's not going to do anything. And David says, God, don't forget the afflicted. God, get up. God, lift up your hands. God, let them be caught in their own schemes. So then we have this question for God again in verse 13. Why does the wicked renounce God? Why do they say in their heart? But look at what it says here. There is this mistaken belief, right? There is this mistaken belief. Look at, uh, look at verse 14. Uh, the mistaken belief is, is that God has forgotten. The mistaken belief is that God will not see it. That's a lie, though, isn't it? It's a lie that these wicked people believe. It's a lie that Satan would love to perpetuate, that the wicked can get away with these things, that God doesn't see it. You know, what, what did the Apostle Paul say? Do not be deceived. And Paul says that phrase three times. It's interesting to look at what he's talking about. But here he says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. God sees. He says, why do you... Say in your heart, we're not going to give an account. So the idea, this, this mistaken idea, is that there's not going to be any, uh, any, any judgment upon them. There's not, they're not going to be held accountable. The wicked are going to be able to get away with this. The psalmist says they renounce God. The idea with this word renounce here in verse 13 is that they speak against God. They despise Him. Uh, they discard Him. The idea means, the word means actually to kind of, has the idea of seeking something out. I think the idea then is that the God's not going to seek them out to do justice. God's not going to seek them out to hold them accountable. They say you're not going to do anything, God. And if God's not going to do anything, I can do whatever I want. You see, but that's a mistaken belief. It's a lie. Look at verse 14. So here's, here they say you will never see, but look at verse 14. But you do see. But you do see. For you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. And again, notice this. Lift up your hands. You note these things. Why, God? So that you can deal with it. You take it up into your hands. Why do you do this? Because he, he does see. So he, does, he is aware. He does take note of the mischief and the vexation. He does it so that he can deal with the problem. To you, the helpless, commits himself. To you have been the helper of the fatherless. The helpless commits himself. Kind of an interesting phrase. That word commits, uh, this Hebrew word means to leave behind, to forsake, to abandon. So how, it's kind of interesting. And I think the idea here is that the helpless, they leave themselves. They abandon themselves in God. Again, we talked about God's will versus my will. You know, submission means to leave yourself, doesn't it? Isn't that the idea of submission? that we are going to submit to God's will, that we leave ourselves, the helpless, they leave themselves, they abandon themselves to God. They abandon themselves to God. They cast everything they are on Him. They look to Him. They realize that they are in complete need of Him. So the helpless abandons himself to God. He commits himself. Then he says, you have been the helper of the fatherless. And here is the third request that David makes in this chapter. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness 
to account till you find none. So the third request, God, break their arm. Hold them accountable. And again, you will not call to account. David says, God, break their arm. Call his wickedness to account. So here we have this third request followed by what David expects, what David's anticipated response by God, if you will. So he now again returns this idea of the king. We see this more in chapter 9. But here we see this idea of a king here. The Lord is king forever and ever. The Lord is on his throne. It may seem like he's not. The wicked are thriving. The wicked are flourishing. They're doing all sorts of bad things. But the Lord is on his throne. He is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O oh Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and to the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. See, David anticipates... God's response. David anticipates the king doing something. David anticipates the righteous judge doing something. Oh Lord, you hear. They were saying, the, whole, the wicked were saying, God doesn't care. God doesn't see. God doesn't hear. David says, God does see. And he says in verse 17, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You know, when did the psalmist in this chapter, when did he feel alone? When did he feel as if God was far away from him, hidden from him? He, he felt as if the wicked were running free. He looked at these things. He saw those who were crushing the weak, crushing the needy, afflicting the oppressed and the fatherless. Where was God in all of this? You know, we at times, as Christians, we should, we should be upset when we see injustice in our community, societal injustice. We should care about these things. The psalmist wanted justice for the needy. He wanted justice. He wanted punishment for those who were trampling underfoot the lives of the weak. We need to care about the weak, the needy, the defenseless, the fatherless in our community. We need to care about those who can't care for themselves. I was speaking with a brother today. You know, we're all concerned about the, corona, the coronavirus pandemic, and I don't, I'm not making light of that. We're concerned about it, and, and you know we do need to be smart and wise and careful. But there is a much worse pandemic. It's a pandemic when we kill babies, isn't it? All over the place. We, abortion all over America. Millions and millions of babies killed. And can, and can and should we look at this crime and be upset? Man, if there is there any group of people less able to take care of themselves than an unborn child. Surely there is nothing more weak, more uh, in need of help. And how horrible when we see these things done. So we can see society and inju societal injustice and community, and we can see this injustice, and we should be upset. And sometimes in our own life, we can feel personal injustice, and we can look and we say, "Where are you, God?" As I'm going through, this, as I'm being mistreated, where are you during these dark times? We can feel alone as we battle this world, can't we? Whether it's as a group, as a church, as a society, as an individual, we can feel alone. We can feel lost. Doubt can creep in. We can start to say, "Where are you, God?" But again, as I go back to what we just saw, as David works through this chapter, he moves from lamenting this apparent absence of God in verse 1 he, he, to an expected reaction of God, an expected action because of who he knows God to be. Again, chapter 9, verse 1, he recounts God's deeds, doesn't he? He knows who God is. And because he knows who God is, what God has done in the past, he, he can expect God to act. He says, you hear the desire of the afflicted. Is that any less true today? Does God still hear the desires of the afflicted? He says, you will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice. And the result of all this, the wicked that was so vexing to David earlier, at the beginning of this chapter, he says, they will strike terror no more. Verse 18. You know, did the early Christians 2,000 years ago living under Roman control, ever feel the powerful enemy of Rome, the empire, what was crushing the small and the innocent? Did they ever look at Rome and that mistreatment that they were going through and say, God, where are you? 
God, why aren't you doing anything? Surely they did. Uh, and if you look at what they said here in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, it, when he opens the fifth seal, it says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long? God, where are you? How long, holy and true Lord, will you not judge and avenge? Where's the justice? Well, will you not judge and avenge our blood from those who live on earth? You see, they did cry out. They wondered also, God, sometimes they wondered, where are you as we're going through this? And God assures them he's on his throne. In chapter 4, that's the whole point of chapter 4. God is on his throne. And God calls his people 2,000 years ago, living underneath Roman persecution. God calls them in this chapter, in this book, God calls them to do one thing. And that's conquer. He calls them to conquer 17 times that word occurs. And he makes a promise to the one who conquers. To the one who conquers. Over and over to the one who conquers. You know, we don't conquer today with swords and shields. They weren't conquering that way 2,000 years ago. They were conquering when they continued to live by faith. Trusting that God was on the throne. Trusting that God is there. That God is is going to act in his time. It's not always our time. It's not always how we want God to act. But when we are living by faith, we don't have to have the answers. We simply give our lives in trust to God. And we continue to live for him. We continue to submit to him like we talked about earlier. We don't live our lives as practical atheists. We live our lives of a life of submission. And we conquer when we recant, when we recount the wonderful deeds that God has done in our lives. We conquer when we can stop and remember God's deliverance in the past. You know, God still hears the cries of the afflicted. God still reigns as a righteous and just king. And brothers and sisters, we still need him every hour, don't we? We still need him every hour of the day. We're going to say a prayer and then a closing song. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, let's go ahead and bow in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you. And Father, there might be some that are hearing this lesson today, Father, that are in need of help. Father, if that's the case, we pray that they might uh, reach out to you, reach out to us here at church, that we might be a help to them. Father, there might be some who have not made that decision to give their life to you, that have not been baptized into your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that if there's those who are struggling and wrestling with their decisions in submitting their lives to you, Father, that we might be a help to them. Father, that they might reach out to us and that we might be able to share your good news with them. We thank you so much. And Father, we are thankful for you that you are on the throne. And Father, we can know that every hour that we need you, every hour that we cry out, you are there. And we thank you for that. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to give you guys a closing song here. Um, and again, please uh, go ahead and join in song with me. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine. And peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour. 
Enjoy your pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me Thine indeed, Thou blessed Son. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee, every hour I need Thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come.